Okay. Yes. So Ben, starting this off, I, um, it's just really cool to have you on because we just had Don on the podcast and he just raved about you and how awesome you are. And it was interesting how it worked out because, um, we were going to do Don's episode later and then we kind of had a mix up. And so we ended up posting it like the day after he recorded it. And then mm-hmm. I was just chatting with you about it. And I just thought, you know what? It would be really cool to have Ben on the podcast because, um, or Bishop Banks as Don, you know, refers to us. So um, I'm still Ben. I- I'm still Ben. We're good. <laughs> so you, you have been in the Times Magazine. You've been, tell us all the places that your story has been published. Oh gosh. I mean, so New York Times Magazine, Time Magazine, uh, I've actually rang the bell for the NASDAQ stock market to close the stock market on World AIDS Day. Uh, The president of the United States, when he was giving a speech for releasing um, like a new policy, invited my wife and I to the White House for that. Oh my gosh. I've traveled, traveled to colleges from like Stanford and Berkeley and UCLA to you know to Texas and Chicago and oh gosh I mean you know Ivy League schools like Columbia and um you know I've I've spoken Rutgers and even locally you know colleges in DC like George Washington University my alma mater James Madison University is where you know my wife and I went to school um uh, yeah, VCU in Richmond, University of Richmond. So, and it's been classroom settings. It's been different groups and everything like that. So, yeah, yeah. I've, I mean, it's it's been out there like student newspapers. It's been in uh, like local newspapers, been radio, TV, different things. So, wow. I'm, and like I said, I'm I'm still just bad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. But your story, I mean, it's super important because I think, I mean, <clears throat> well, we'll get into it, but that would be like life, obviously just really challenging to be able to grapple with what you've been through as, you know, just getting through that. And so I'm really, I'm really curious to hear how that affected your, your spiritual growth and, you know, where your testimony was at during those times. And, um, you know, so yeah, let's, let's just jump into it and start from the beginning. From the beginning, but yeah, so really it's at my, my first thought is to, to thank you for this this platform um, because I think it's really important. Like you say, I mean, as as Satan uses his his d- deception and he uses uh, you know like his like your know, partial partial truths and and kind of deceiving people, I, I think that that there's so much out there that is is negative in the world, and we need this to be a positive impact and a positive influence and. And I know that you were truly inspired to do this and to to give the opportunity. I mean, I, I I listen to your podcast every week and I've been doing it for months. And it's really like it's like a fast and testimony meeting like every week. You know, it's like give people that opportunity. And so I enjoy it, um, but I have never I've never been like, you know, like someone who's left or stopped going. Um, but the impact that I have it started when I was when I was two. Um, so at, at the age of two, and this is in 1981, Southern California. My my dad was in the Marine Corps, so we were we were near like uh, Balboa Hospital, which is a naval hospital in San Diego. And I went in for the hospital, and I had like clean bill of health, everything looked good. And then three weeks later. Um, it's it's a word that no parent ever wants to hear is is your child has cancer and i was diagnosed with stage five which there is a stage five my my wife and other people don't believe me but when i show my medical charts i was diagnosed with stage five bilateral whims with mets to both lungs and so what that was is uh, i was diagnosed with cancer on both my kidneys that had spread to both my lungs and they just looked at my parents and said it's going to be a miracle if your son lives through surgery Mm. not not lives through treatment but if he actually lives through the surgery immediately you know you know my mom is a convert to the church but my dad side of the family if you go through genealogy um 
first members were were baptized in the 1830s in upstate New York. Um, Joseph Smith Sr. was giving some of my relatives their patriarchal blessing. Um, they were in the Kirtland Temple during the dedication. Um, if you read the Joseph Smith papers, some of my relatives um, are like are are in the book um, and. You know, they, they, they traveled to Missouri, they traveled to, to Nauvoo, um, one of the first, you know, the pioneers that came with the actual, the Hunt Company and the Martin Hancock Company and, and multiple companies that came across the plains. My great grandmother was one of the children that was carried across the river by the three teenage boys that perished because of the service that they provided. Um, the really cool thing is, is so, so, so many generations on my dad's side and my mom a convert, but they both have very strong, you know, faith in, in power of the priesthood. And so um, my, my home teacher, just because my dad didn't want to administer a blessing and, and say his will, his will versus the, the Lord's will. And so I received a, the priesthood blessing that said that the Lord has the power over life and death. And it be his will for me to survive that I will continue my earthly mission. But if it was my time to, to pass on that, my family would accept it. And they knew that I completed my mission and received my body here upon the earth. So that was like, like the, the, the first of like a really, you know, building of the testimony. That was the first block that really like kind of laid, laid the cornerstone. And I had 15 hour surgeries where they actually had do multiple doctors that came in in rotation. Unfortunately, my right kidney was a complete tumor. It, I had a, a 15 inch by 11 inch tumor and it was growing rapidly. And then they did a partial, what's called a partial left nephrectomy where they took out a one inch and a two inch tumor out of my left kidney. And then I, I went through 15 months of chemotherapy and I went through 15 months of radiation therapy. Mm. So my hair fell out five different times. Um, you know, it, it, my, I joke with my mom because it came in curly, it came in red, it came in blonde, it came in, and I was like, yeah, I bet you, you wanted me to have like curly red hair. And she's like, no, whatever. But um, I'm stuck, stuck with this, this kind of jet black hair. This, this is, you know, natural. That's what, that's what I was gifted with uh, based on the treatment. I was, I was born with really light brown hair. Um, I dropped down to about 20 pounds. Like if you just touch me, I'd bruise. Um, and I received a third blood transfusion because during treatment, my platelet count dropped so low that I started bleeding through the pores on my hands, my face, and my feet. Mm -hmm. And I was three years old at the time, and I can still remember that pain. Mm -hmm. And that was the most excruciating pain I've ever felt. It's it, it, There's no way to really describe that. But my body thrived. My, my body, the, 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 the chemo, like, I mean, it, it pounded me hard, but it, it actually gave me, you know, strength as I, I, you know, my body, my body accepted, you know, these, these, these poisons more or less to, to, to rid the cancer of my body. Um, slowly over time, I, I started to go from, you know, multiple hospital visits to, you know, once a week to once a month, once a quarter, every six months. And then I finally got up to the point where I only had to go see you know, the oncologist like once a year, just, just for a regular physical checkup, just, you know, rule out um, any, anything that like may have returned. And so it was easy for me to see, you know, the scars on my body and to know what I physically went through. You know, I have a nine inch scar on my abdomen. I had a drain tube scar, you know, that that's about an inch and a half on my side. I have a, a, you know, a scar on my wrist uh, from where they, I kept pulling the IV out. So they actually stitched it in and I still pulled it out. Mm -hmm. um, I had an IV in my jugular vein. I had oxygen. I mean, and so I, I could see the, 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 the trauma that my body received and I knew what I had come through. And I knew that the Lord does have the authority and the power to heal a person. But I think as we read, especially in the scriptures, you know, my testimony was strengthened of a lot of times, I think, especially in Luke, Luke is my favorite book of scripture. You know, he's a physician. He focused on a lot of the healing, but I think with the, the healing comes hope. I think, you know, as the savior healed, you know, the leper or made the blind, this, that, it was that he physically healed their body, but he spiritually healed their body. 
and he provided hope. One of my, you know, favorite things to tell people and share is, is I, I believe love is the most powerful word in the English language, but hope is the second most powerful word in the English language. Without hope, there, there, there's no future. There's no tomorrow. There, it, there's nothing to look forward to. And so I, I had those reminders on my body of like what I was healed of, what I made it through, what I survived. You know, here they said, it won't, you won't, it would be a miracle if you live through surgery and here years have gone by and I continue to, to excel in school and, you know, have very minimal side effects, you know, here, like, I mean, I'm not wearing glasses now, but, you know, I started wearing glasses like in kindergarten. I, I had to have tubes in my ears because I couldn't hear very well. And so, like, I remember, like, my kindergarten teacher telling my mom, like, my best student can't see or hear. Mm -hmm. And and it, it was all a result of a lot of the treatment that I received. Um, I remember when I was, so I was 12 years old. And I, for me, like, I would always have to wake up really early, drive a really far distance to, like, the military hospital to get the, you know, see the oncologist and and get, you know, blood work done and and get a physical and get checked over and, and it was just like for me it was like another appointment you know it was like may 22nd 1991 it was the end of my seventh grade year and i woke up early drove through washington dc traffic and got to the hospital up there and the doctor because my dad being marine it was the same doctor that saw me when i was first recovering and getting done with treatment so he's like oh my gosh like you've grown you put on weight your hair's back i mean all these, all these wonderful things. And he's like, oh, we'll just do a quick physical and send you on your way. And I was like, nah, you know, his platelet count was off and this, that we really need to do blood work. We needed to check and make sure everything is, is right in the body. No big deal. Like I've been, you know, like put my arm out, you know, go ahead, take as much blood as you want, like go for it. You know, like no big deal. I've been doing it for, you know, the last 10 years. So like what's another, you know, needle, needle stick, you know, blood draw. And so few days pass and I remember I came home from school and I walked up the stairs and I turned the corner and my mom was sitting on the edge of the bed crying and I'm like innocently 12 year old mom like why are you crying and she said the doctor's called she's like you're HIV positive and I immediately froze and went numb and I collapsed into my mom's arms. And I don't know how long it was from when she spoke those words to when I remember her just rubbing my head and holding me tight, saying, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. And so here, unknowingly, one of the blood transfusions that saved my life from cancer was contaminated with HIV. Uh, blood wasn't tested for HIV until 1985. And so Southern California, early 80s, it was like, that was the, the you know, that's, that's where the, where, where the, the blood transfusions came from. And so now I went from like seeing an oncologist to seeing an infectious disease doctor. I went from, you know, having a disease that is socially accepted, there's a cure, to now living with a disease that's highly, especially in the early 90s, that was their stigma, discrimination. You know, at the time, people were getting kicked out of school. They were, you know, having bricks thrown through their window. They had, um, you, know, their, you know, things burned in their yard. I mean, it just, my whole world got flipped upside down. And I remember I received another priesthood blessing. And now I'm in Virginia. So we're, we're California and Virginia, two separate men. And this tells me that how true the priesthood is that's been restored upon the earth is almost word for word, the same blessing that I received 10 years prior. But this time it said, you'll live to see your blood be cleansed and you'll live to see your posterity. Oh my gosh. And wow. so I was like, okay. And, and, and that, that, you know, and, and that's, it's, it's crazy to think because as at 12 years old, I never thought it would take, and we'll get more into this, but 22 years, it was one month shy of 22 years when my daughter was born. I had to wait 21 
years and 11 months for that blessing to be fulfilled. And I'll tell you, we operate in God's time, not in our time. And, but I never lost hope. I never lost faith. I, I bore testimonies of, I will live to see my posterity. And the joke with my, after my wife was like, you know, she, she's been very supportive. Like we've been together for like 24 years, but she was like, okay, now that our daughter's born, does that mean that you're going to die? And I'm like, no, like, no, like it just means the blessing has been fulfilled. Um, at that time, like, so shortly after that, like Magic Johnson came public and he was one of the like biggest names, most like, you know, celebrated people. And so it was talked about, but it wasn't talked about very positively. And so here I, I had to go through that whole summer between seventh and eighth grade fighting for the opportunity to attend public school. Like my parents paid taxes. Like there was no reason why, like I wasn't a threat. I wasn't, you know, you know, like posing any problem. I was like a straight A student. And here the superintendent a few weeks before the start of school finally said, we will give you permission to attend public school, but we're not going to tell anybody in the school except for the principals, the nurse, the guidance counselor, your PE and your science teacher in case something happens, like when you're doing like an experiment or, you know, playing sports. They're like, other than that, nobody. And we don't want you and we're not giving you permission to keep your medication in the clinic because we don't want anybody to know a student in our school has HIV. So here I had to take AZT, which is a highly toxic medication every six hours. Mm -hmm. And I had to plan it to where I would do it around my lunch schedule. So I would, on my way to lunch, pop into the restroom, go into a stall without any water, just put the capsule in my mouth, swallow it, and come back out. And I always had a plan, like, because most most eighth graders don't have to worry about something like that. They worry about, like, who they're going to sit with at lunch. I had to worry about how am I going to keep this a secret, and then how am I going to get my medication taken without anybody knowing? And so I was like, oh, I have to wash my hands before I go to lunch. That was my that was my backup plan of like, why do I go to the bathroom every time before I you know head into the cafeteria? And so uh, all through middle school and all through high school, like not a single person knew. And, and through social media and, and through you know other avenues, like I've reconnected with old classmates and they read my story and they read about what I'm doing in my life. And they're like, I never knew. And I'm like, right, I never told you. And, and they're just like, wow. And I'm like, but you don't understand, like eighth grade was so hard with, you know, all the, 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 the loneliness feelings, the, um, you know, the, uh, you know, the, 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 the jokes about Magic Johnson. And I mean, there was like times I just want to scream out, I have HIV, but that wasn't a reality. I couldn't do that. I had to protect my siblings. I had to protect, you know, the people around me. Um, and, and that feeling, it's, it's that feeling prepared me for, for moments when I served as Bishop, um, I, I wrote shortly after the pandemic. So like, obviously viral pandemics don't bother me. They don't scare me. I've been living with one for 42 years now um, and, and not to downplay COVID any, but like I was, I was called by a person, you know, it was, it was, it was President Monson was, was the, the, the prophet at the time. But when I was 19, I still prepared to serve a mission. And it was President Hinckley, President Monson, and President Faust, who I my bishop received a letter. And a lot of people, this, and it's always how I, I love semantics. I love reading. But the letter said, unfortunately, due to health concerns, you are not going to be able to serve a full-time mission. Anybody who ha has HIV or has had HIV cannot serve a mission. Now, this is, you know, like, you know, in the 90s. And so... I took that as like, oh, has had, has had, right? They're like, they put it in past tense. Obviously, they're prophets, seers, and revelators. They know like what's going on. Um, but you know, President Monson was a part of the first presidency that said, I can't serve a mission. But now, as an HIV positive individual, like I was able to serve as bishop. And I had, you know, members of the congregation, they're like, oh, are you the first HIV positive bishop in the church? And I'm like, I don't know, like maybe, like it's not a big deal. But but as I served, the pandemic started and I mobilized the ward very quickly and was able to talk and stuff. But I was able to share 
Um, and I'm going to read it because I don't want to, I don't want to mess it up. I, I shared a, um, a, a spiritual thought. So that was one of the things that we did was we shared spiritual thoughts from members of the congregation. We would, we'd send it out to the whole ward. Um, but I, I sent, I sent this one um, about five, six months after the pandemic started, after temple shut down, you know, meeting services shut down in person and everything like that. And so I said, um, you know, May 22nd, 1991, I remember the day as if it were yesterday. It was the day for my tenure checkup for cancer. It was the day to celebrate being cancer free for 10 years. It was the day my 12 year old self had my world flipped upside down. It was the day I was diagnosed with HIV, which I received through a blood transfusion that saved my life from cancer. At 12 years old, I became part of one of the biggest pandemics of all time. A lot of unknowns still existed more than a decade after the first diagnosis. In 1991, it was a time when people reacted in fear, panic, or even hopelessness. I spent many days and nights feeling alone, but how could I feel alone in a home with eight other siblings at the time? I felt like nobody could understand me. Nobody could feel the pain I was feeling. I felt so isolated because I did not know anyone like me. I spent many days sitting alone in a tree covered cove behind our house where a little creek fed into the lake. I always been in peace in nature. So I would usually sit on a log and listen to the creek slowly pass by. Every day in the cove, I would pray and find a scripture to read. I remember reading Ether 12, 14. It reads, Quote, wherefore, whosoever believeth in God might sh with surety hope for a better world, yea, even a place at the right hand of God, which hope cometh of faith, maketh an anchor to the souls of men, which would make them sure and steadfast, always abounding in good works, being led to glorify God, close quote. At that moment, I realized there is always hope. Even in a time full of fear and panic, there is always hope. And so... That that scripture um, has kind of guided me um, in 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 going forward. Um, my patriarchal blessing has also been a very very strong um, strong influence in my life. Um, I remember I, I received it on July fourth, which was really cool, um, and I was fourteen years old. And I met with the patriarch um, before I received my my blessing and. He didn't know much about me, but I know he's called of God. I know he's inspired. And right before he laid his hands upon my head, he looked at me and said, look, your blessing is not going to say many things that are similar in other uh, patriarchal blessings. Um, you've already been promised them. They are not going to be repeated. Um, Ooh, so nowhere else. <laughs> So nowhere in my patriarchal blessing says anything about a family. It has no mention of that. And, and he said that. He said, you've been promised that already in special blessings. Um, but in my patriarchal blessing, um, it says, you've been given special trials and tribulations, not only to improve yourself, but to improve others. Many people will be grateful for the life that you live. Um, make sure that you share your testimony at every opportunity you get. And, you know, my mom, and I love her, she was very aware of how much HIV was stigmatized and uh, discriminated against that she, she kind of held me back until I got to college and I kind of got on my own. And uh, I said, mom, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to start speaking publicly. I'm going to start sharing, um, you know, like what it was like living with HIV and, and growing up with, you know, surviving cancer and HIV and she's like well I guess that's part of growing up I mean I'm not you know and, and the first time I, I spoke I spoke on a, a huge panel at George Washington University for town hall day around World AIDS Day and it was moderated by Miss America um, they had you know the the president's like AIDS advisor on this panel they had um, like Scott Wolf from like Party of Five and and uh, you know different like movies and tv shows um, they had other AIDS activists on there. They had um, someone from the West Wing um, whose family had adopted children with HIV. They had uh, another advocate from like South Africa. They had the the HIV vaccine research um, director like sitting on and and here I'm like this like college kid right. I'm like this punk kid and and 
and that was the first time of course mom was like is there gonna be pictures i'm like mom like do you know who's on this panel like of course there's gonna be pictures taken like you know and and i'll tell you how long ago i still have it on vhs <laughs> that's how long ago that was but but it, it, it gave me opportunities because I think part of the healing process is being able to express and being able to, um, you know, share. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my first time that I, I decided to tell a friend that I had HIV, um, it was, it was scary. I mean, like, I'm, I'm like a little scrawny guy, like he's a big guy. Like, I'm like, what if he starts swinging? What if he wants to like hurt me? And I really, I really thought like, you know, I'll tell them at my house, I'll have my family as backup. Like if I start, you know, so, you know, I, you know, I, I, as I started sharing, like he just started crying and crying and, and I knew that he, I mean, the questions were like, are you going to die? Are you going to get hurt? Are you going to, and so I, I, you know, I knew that, that he accepted me and that gave me the momentum. It was when I spoke at uh, McNeese State in Lake Charles, Louisiana, I was actually invited by the NAACP student group to speak. And the students came up afterwards were like, I enjoyed your testimony. I was like, it is. I'm testifying of the goodness of the Lord and like how he's blessed my life and he's preserved my life for a purpose. And, you know, and I think that's, you know, we all have the ability to to impact one another's life. I mean, that's life is full of, of, of making human connections, like interacting with people and, and helping one another. We all have trials. We all have different experiences, but at the end of the day, like we're here to love one another. We're here yeah. to lighten each other's burdens. And, and I think when we, we see past ourselves, like that's when I think our heavenly parents are the happiest. Yeah. Uh oh, I love that so much. I, I have to say that while you're talking about yourself in eighth grade, the thing that I'm thinking of is your mom, because like my daughter, she was at school and one of the kids in her class said something rude to her. And it had been like a while, you know, ago that it happened. But one night we were just she was laying by me and she said, mom. And she like told me what happened. And I was like, what, excuse me. And she said, you know, I said, what did you say back? And she said, I said, oh, <laughs> I just, when you were talking about that, going to the bathroom to take your pills, I just thought about like what your mom had to have been going through as a mother watching her child have to endure such horrible trials. And I just, oh my gosh, like that just, I mean, just to watch your eighth grade self, like go yeah. through something so hard and have to worry about keeping it a secret. And that just seems like, I don't know. That is so hard. And I think, I don't know, like just to see how God can work all things to the good of those who love him. And he's taken this horrible thing that you had to go through and he's turned it into something amazing because you've been able to share your story with so many people and make such a huge impact. I will tell you, so sometimes while we're going through the trial that's the hardest yeah it's it's you don't understand why like you know god doesn't always share the whys with you right away he, you know he wants you to try to figure it out and 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 you know he's not gonna he's not gonna leave you but he 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 will give you the space to to figure it out and while i was serving as bishop there was an eighth grader um one of the youth in the ward that was really, really, really struggling. Um, like, you know, self-infliction, like some harm, self-harm, um, depression, isolation, feeling lonely. And I just sobbed with him. I, I just bawled with him because I was able to share that moment of how I felt in eighth grade. And this, this, this youth is my buddy. I, they, you know, years later, that moment I knew, like I knew I suffered that in eighth grade to help him while he was struggling. Wow. 
Wow, that's so amazing. Yeah, and it's like I said, I mean, like I received the blessing that I'd live to see my posterity and, you know, 22 years. I had to wait 22 years and because I had to wait for what we call science fiction and then 10 years later become science. And so, um, you know, the process that we used, I'm not going to go into a lot of details, but um, is actually illegal in some states um, just because of, uh, you know, what what happened in the early stages of the research and stuff like that, where some women ended up uh, with HIV um, because because of the, the procedures and the process that it took. But my daughter biologically is my child. Wow. Yeah. How did that tell us more about that? How how much detail do you want me to go in? Well, I, as much as you feel is appropriate. <laughs> I'm I'm gonna, I'm gonna lay it out there. Yep. You 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 could take this how you want. Okay. Yes. Um, if if it makes the cut, it makes the cut. Um, <laughs> so 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 we we wanted to have a child, and so it's called the Sarah Discordant Couple. So I'm HIV positive. My wife is HIV negative. Okay. And so let me, let me back. So when we started, so, so she's the same age as my younger sister. And so she knew um, me through stories at like girls camp and like, you know, like friends that we were mutual. And if you ask her, she'd be like, no way would I ever marry the teenage Ben Banks, you know, like, I was very stubborn. Um, like I, I was, I was pretty quiet, but like, I, I like to be left alone because of, I, I needed to be in my thoughts and, and, and I, you know, it was, it was a struggle like living with, with HIV as a teenager, you know, just where do I fit in? Wh what's going to happen? What's, you know, what, what are we going to, you know, like it was just a lot going on, but she, her freshman year of college, and I'm a little bit older than her. Um, you know, one of our mutual friends who I've known for many years, hung out, whatever, like introduces, like, I it was that like, you know, young single adults playing volleyball. Like I was like, about ready to serve. And she's like, Hey, meet, meet my friend Kasaya. And I'm like, hi, you know, of course, like I look back and I'm like, man, first impression, like that was not love at first sight. Right. <laughs> it was like, just get out of my way. I'm trying to serve. Like I'm trying to play volleyball here. Hi, how you doing? Nice to meet you. Um, you know, but over time, like we, you know, we started emailing and talking to one another and, and, you know, we ended up like, I went down to, to visit my buddies um, at the college that she was going to. And I'd been going like the previous years before, but you know, it was funny. I had just wrecked my car, totaled it. Um, and I needed to borrow my mom's vehicle. And I was like, mom, I need to go down to JMU. Like I, and she's like, tell your buddies to come home. I'm like, no mom, it's about a girl. Like, you know, like this is not about, you know, this. And so, you know, we hung out that weekend and like that by the end of that weekend, before I was driving back home, like we were dating and we've been together ever since. And, you know, of course, you know, her parents, you know, like, okay, he's got HIV. And, and the moment that I knew like that we, cause we dated for four and a half years before we got sealed, oh. the, before we got married. Yeah. It was, it, you know, not your normal courtship, you know, everybody's like, when you get married, when you get married, and then we got married, and then we were married for 10 years before we had a child, and they're like, when you have a baby, when you have a baby, but, um, but, like, when she told me, so her mom was like, you know, what if he gets sick and dies, like, what are you gonna do, and she, and she told her mom, she's like, I'd rather be with him than to never be with him, like, mm -hmm. Like, I'm not going to change that. So if he does get sick and dies, like, fine. But like, I'm going to be with him. Like, and I'm like, okay, like hook, line, singer, done. Like, this is it. Like, we're, we're, we're going to do it. Um, but, but we knew we were going to have a family. And, and, and my wife had faith in the, the priesthood blessing that I did receive when I, when I was 12. And so we, we had to figure out like, okay, where can we go? And we looked in like the East Coast and, and we found two places. One was Bedford Research Foundation in Boston, Massachusetts. And the other one was at Columbia's um, hospital, University Hospital in New York City. And so we're like, all right, we found two, like kind of close, you know, like short flight away. So um, you call one and I call one. So she calls Bedford and it's like, go straight to voicemail. Like no no way to talk to a person. It's, it's a clinic, it's a laboratory. So she leaves the message. I call 
Columbia and they're like, thanks for calling Columbia Women's Resource. Like, you know, I'm like, I'm like, oh, geez. I'm like, so I kind of explain like, I have HIV, my wife doesn't, we'd like to have a child. They're like, hold on. And they transfer me. And then like, I sit and they're like, hold on. And I'm sure they thought I was prank calling them. And I'm like, cause I called the women's resource. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, I'm a dude. My wife's a girl. I get it. But she flipped the coin. She got the other one. I got this one. And then finally, so we got information. We ended up going with Bedford Research Foundation. And so in order for us to have a child, what they want to do, it, the safest way at the time that, that we found was, was through what's called sperm washing. So we actually, it was crazy. So they sent us a FedEx box. They gave us everything to collect, collect a sample. And they're like, you need to FedEx it overnight. Don't, they're like, don't worry. Prize bowl owners have been doing this for years. And I'm like, did you just compare me to a prize bowl? I'm like, all right. I was like, I was like, I can, I can handle this. And they're like, and if they ask you what's inside the box, you tell them preservatives. And I'm like, all right. So basically we, you know, I drive to the local FedEx, which is like 15 minutes from my house. And the one time that UPS, FedEx, the post office doesn't ask me for what's inside because it already had the label on. They're like, just put it on the counter. And I'm like, oh, man, like so they send it up there. And so what they do is they they kind of like you know, centrifuge with blood. So they spin it and they separate it. And so they take the sperm out of the semen sample mm -hmm. because all the white blood cells and everything else that's in semen will contain potentially can, contain HIV. And so they tested for HIV and they require two samples. And so we did it again. And so they became, so they basically um, preserved it. They froze it. And then they FedExed it back down to, to Richmond, Virginia. And so through artificial insemination. And, and so my wife, um, so that wasn't covered by insurance or anything like that, but my wife um, through you know, the artificial insemination was, was all covered. And so, after the second attempt, she's like, oh, man. So and I was like, hey, it's you know, it's going to take five tries. It's going to be on the fifth attempt. And she's like, why? She's like, it's only 20 percent chance. I'm like, I know. But like 20 percent plus 20 percent plus 20 percent plus 20 and 20. Like that is like 100 percent. And she's like, no, it's only 20 percent each time. I'm like, but sure enough, after the fifth attempt, like, wow. Yeah. And so so, you know, through the whole process, we, we had a doctor and, and this is how everything lines up. So I was calling like Virginia Andrology and IVF Center and they're like, no, you have HIV. We can't store your sample because we actually can't keep it with the rest of them because of potential like transfers and switches. And so I was calling like Baltimore, like DC, like, I mean, I was, I was calling like hours away trying to see if any of them would take it. And they're like, nope. So this doctor just happened to come to VCU from Washington, D.C. and was doing this process. And my wife works at VCU. And so like here, this guy is in the VCU Women's Health Center in the building next to Virginia Andrology and IVS Center and calls him up and says, no, it's already been tested. It's HIV negative. They immediately took it. So I oh, called him up and he said, no. So here, this doctor just happens to start here at VCU. He's already familiar with this process. He calls the center and says, no, he's good. Wow. It's in the building next door. And like all of these things, like boom, 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 like just like fell in line. Oh my and God. nine nine months later, well, 41 weeks later, like my wife, my wife worked Friday, a full clinic, saw her patients. And she had to be back at VCU on Monday at 8 a.m. And Finley was born Monday at 8 a.m. Oh my God. Either, either way, she would have had to been at work. And so, yeah, so so we went through that. But like like I said, that process is illegal in some states because of, yeah, you know, in the early process of it, early days of it, um, unfortunately, some women ended up testing positive for HIV. So, wow. But, yeah. Wow. So, what is it like today? Do you have, I mean, how does it affect your health today? Honestly, like, so I've never, I've never had a sign or symptom. I've never, I've never had any other, you know, like when I was in college, I don't know how, how I did it. Um, I took 25 pills a day when I was in college. Gosh. 
this one had to be refrigerated. This one had to be taken with food. This one had to be taken without food. This, I mean, I literally had like my class schedule and I had my take your medicine schedule. And I had to somehow, you know, as a full-time college kid and working like 20 to 25 hours a week and take the 25 pills. But today I only take one pill. I take one pill a day. Wow. They basically they've, they've come to the point where they can combine the different medications into one pill. And, but the thing is, if you miss that one pill, now you're missing 24 hours of protection. Mm. So, but, but it, it's amazing to see the progress and, and how in, you know, the eighties, then the nineties, the 2000s yeah. and today it's, it's just amazing. And, and over the years, I've been very blessed with the opportunity to go back to pediatric clinics and, and just play with some of the children that are, that are in there, that are suffering. I can now talk to the families. Um, I, one of my pediatric social workers, it's, this is funny. So she's Jewish and NIH, the National Institutes of Health is where I go. And so it's the, it's federally funded. It's like one of the premier institutions in the world. So they actually bring people in for different trials and different studies. And there was a young boy, he was seven years old um, from Orlando, Florida, who was a member of the church. And this Jewish social worker was like, Ben, 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 I need you to come meet him. I need to meet your family and be with him. Wow. And, and, and so like, and so she, even she knows my faith and she knows, I mean, cause the Washington DC temple just got renovated and remodeled and basically brought up to like modern century, you know, like, you know, like, you know, if, if you were disabled, you couldn't even get to the baptismal font because there was, there was stairs down to it. There's no elevator to it. So now there's an elevator to it and stairs. Um, but, but so even she knows that like, that's my temple, like that's wow. where I go. And, and so she knows my faith. She knows the blessings that I've received in my life. And, and that, you know, even the doctors up at NIH, you know, men of science who have to prove everything go, you know, cause right now I'm one of my trials just ended. So I'm on four different trials, just different studies. Like, you know, this one, they want to look at like my liver, this one, they want to look at like, you know, the psychosocial aspect and then, and so forth. And, but there, are th these, 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 these scientists, these researchers who have to prove everything, like they can't just go on a hunch. They have to, they go, we don't know why you're still alive, but we know someone's looking out for you. And they like point at the sky. and the Oh my gosh. They're, they're like, somebody is looking out for you. And they're like, we would appreciate it is if you keep coming back here as long as you can to allow us to study you as long as you can. And I, and I share with them my patriarchal blessing, which it's, it's hard to really explain to, you know, to them, but I'm like, yeah. it says my life, you know, people are appreciate Like I am here for this purpose. I have been preserved. I've been kept alive. And they're like, well, keep doing what you're doing. Cause whatever you're doing, it's working. And I'm like, it's, it's not me. It's just the blessings that have been poured down yeah. upon me. Wow. That is so cool. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I can relate in the, the aspect of, you know, with my drug addiction, just so, you know, it was such a dark place, but I feel like now it's like, my roadmap to getting clean and sober and, you know, relying on the church and the savior's atonement to change my life has been like a, you know, other people who have kids that are going through it, or they're going through it themselves. It's like, I can give them my roadmap for how I made it through and they can, you know what I mean? So I think that it's just really cool to see how God can just orchestrate things to be such a gift when they're actually like, they don't appear as a gift, but, right. um, so I just think that's so cool. Um, so tell me what advice would you give to somebody that's maybe struggling with, you know, a, an illness or their struggle, maybe their spouse has an illness or what advice would you give to them? So a lot of it, like, so it's ABCs, your attitude becomes your character. You know, if you have an outlook on life that it's going to be horrible, like it's going to be horrible, like it just is. But if you have a outlook that life could be wonderful, it could be beautiful. That's what it's going to be. Um, I will, I will tell you. So my brother died from a seizure when he was 22 years old. 
Oh my gosh. I know we gave my mom a lot of gray hair. Um, yeah. He had, he had grand mal seizures, so he'd stop breathing. I mean, he had seizures while he was driving on the interstate. He had seizures on the school bus. I mean, he, you know, every time he hit a growth spurt, like his medicine would be out of whack and stuff. And so both of us living with a life-threatening illness um, became really, really close. Um, in fact, I mean, I was actually about to take stage at UCLA and speak in front of thousands of students when I found out he had died. And I still did. Um, I did cancel. I was supposed to speak at Stanford the next day. I did cancel Stanford and I flew home. But that that hit me the hardest. Um, and piece of advice is like, he's not dead. He's not dead. Um, you know, his body may be, but his spirit is not. Um, and that that was hard. I mean, I lived with survivor's guilt for a little while because I'm like, God, like, I'm older than him. Like, I mean, why take me like let him, you know, 22 is still a baby, you know, and granted, I mean, I was still like in my 20s as well, but I was I was closer to 30. Fortunately, he wasn't able to serve a mission as well because of the seizures. But he wasn't he didn't get a chance to take out his endowments. And I did it for him. Wow. And I remember passing through the veil and in the Washington DC temple in the celestial room is 12 crystal chandeliers. And they're normally peaceful and quiet. And my family that was already through the veil waiting for me to come through for my brother. All of those were ting, 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 ting. And he, it was him saying, I'm here. I'm here with you. Wow. And so that, you know, it, Obviously, we didn't stop praying for my brother. Like, we knew that he was sick. We knew he had struggles. And we knew how he was going to die. We just didn't know when. But I know I'll see him again. Without a doubt, I know I'll see him again. And those moments in the temple that Brigham Young said, the veil is very thin the spirits are here on earth with us mm -hmm. we get those moments and so if a spouse or a child dies like i miss my brother every single day but gets me up in the morning and allows me to go forward is knowing that this life isn't the end yeah that's so good you've been through so much like just so much and it's i mean you have stayed strong in your testimony through all of the things that you've been through. Um, what, what advice would you have for somebody that's struggling with, you know, you've, you've been a Bishop. I'm sure you've seen a lot of people that have struggled, but what advice would you have for somebody that's struggling with their testimony in the midst of trials? So one of the things, so like for, for me, like one of the, so the viral load being undetectable, meaning it's like very minimal inside my body is it's the size of my pinky nail okay that's how much virus the hiv virus is inside my body am i going to allow that to define my whole being and so anybody that's struggling with the trial like it's their pinky nail it's it's the small part like the atonement of our savior and redeemer jesus christ makes them worthy of the blessings to still be poured down upon them. They may need just a hug. They may need a phone call, a text message. Um, you know, it, it's, it goes back to the hope. Like, like when, when I was, when I was serving as Bishop and I met with members during, like, especially during a membership council, one of the most spiritual experiences ever in my life because the atonement was real it was present but one of the questions that i always asked every member that came there was have you forgiven yourself and they would kind of contemplate that and go i haven't and i said you need to like and, and we'll get you there um you know I told him, I said, you know, bishops may be judges in Israel, but 
our roles aren't really to judge you. It's to judge the path and your your where your progression is. You know, we're we're to judge what path in you're headed on and to help you get on the covenant path. That's what we're judging. We're not judging you. Mm-hmm. We're we're judging your footsteps. And so I think when people realize that like I can't go back to church. Like I've got tattoos now, or I can't go back to church. I've done this, this, and this. And I said, every single person in that congregation, including myself is here in the repair garage. This isn't a showroom, right? We're in a repair garage. We're, we're getting fixed every single one. And so it goes to like, just everybody has something and everybody has something to offer. Um, cause you never know who's struggling. Um, you know, people with addiction, they hide it. They hide it very well. Um, nobody knew I had HIV until I told them, um, you know, and, and so we all have something that we're going through and we don't know who needs to hear it. Yeah. And, and, and just, just, I told them like, you come back, everyone's going to love you. They're just going to wrap their arms. They're going to be excited to see you. Mm-hmm. Like you're part of the family. Yep. So. I love that. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the podcast. Your story is so amazing. And I, I mean, obviously it's not our typical comeback story, but I know mm-hmm. that there is people that are listening to the podcast that need to hear this. And so I'm so grateful that you took the time to come on with us. So thank you so much. Oh, thank you. It's my pleasure. Uh, like I said, keep doing the wonderful things you're doing because it, it, it's needed. And and the messages, like I said, I gain strength from the testimonies I hear um, each, yeah. each week. Me too. <laughs> thank you.